In this video, I'm gonna discuss the best character builds in The Legend of Dragoon. But before that, I'm gonna discuss the weapons and armors themselves, who wants it, where to find it, and I'm also gonna talk about why you should consider not using some of it, particularly the first time you play through the game. And then, we'll talk about building a character. There are extensive timestamps throughout this video, so feel free to skip around and rewatch stuff if you need to hear the information again. In general, the rule for weapons is just equip the most powerful weapon, the weapon with the highest attack stat. But let's just take it character by character for now. And by the way, in general in this guide, if I don't tell you where to find a weapon or armor piece, it's just sitting in a shop for you to buy at a reasonable price, or you get it in a standard story battle. Dart's weapons increase in power gradually until you get the Soul Eater, which represents a massive increase in power at the cost of 10% of his health per turn. To get this this weapon, you have to do a side quest in the glacier area. Slide down this hill here and then enter the shrine. Once you finish fighting the monster that appears, you'll get the weapon automatically. By the way, I won't be able to show where to get every weapon and armor item in this video, but if you want a video like that, let me know in the comments. This weapon is undoubtedly Dart's best weapon if you want him to do big PP damage. And fortunately, if you equip the therapy ring, which I'll talk about a little bit later, it will negate the health he loses from this weapon. He won't be able to use extra speed items, but I think that's okay, and we'll also talk about those items a little bit later. There are three other interesting weapons that you might want to consider for Dart, though. The first and arguably the least useful is Mind Crush, which causes the Confuse status. And even though I say the least useful, it does have a very niche use. If you want to grind fast, this is a great weapon. Now, the Rainbow Bird is available once you have access to a boat. But it's not your boat, which is a good thing, since owning a boat is bad, but having access to somebody else's boat is amazing. Just don't own a boat, the maintenance is too much. In any case, the Rainbow Bird is vulnerable to only two forms of damage. Damage from sachets, or sachets, however you pronounce that, which are a very rare item that is hard to farm, and self-inflicted damage, namely from the Confuse status. Now sadly, I think it's still faster to farm sachets than try to confuse those dumb bird brains, but if you prefer self-inflicted confusion damage, damage over farming that item, it's your prerogative to pick your poison. Except it's not vulnerable to poison, so you actually can't pick that. Dart's second useful item is the Fairy Sword, which increases his spirit points by 50%. This is useful if you want to use your Dragoon form or to just level it up quickly. I think Dart is not the best person to do this, though. Use Shanna or Meru for optimal results. Probably Meru, she's better. And the third weapon that's great for Dart is the Heat Blade. The Heat Blade is Dart's only way to do elemental damage with his physical attacks, and more importantly, with his Dragoon attacks. And this allows Dart to use a fun strategy. If you use the special command with Dart, he creates a field that increases all fire damage done by 1.5. If you have the Heat Blade equipped, Dart's Dragoon additions also get increased by the power of the special field by a factor of what I think is 1.5. And since Dart also gets a meaty strength bonus in Dragoon form, this can be a really nice way to get some extra damage for free. That being said, I overall just recommend using the Soul Eater. The HP drain is reasonably easy to compensate for, and the overall power of this weapon will likely be higher than any other form of damage Dart can use. Lavitz really only has one unique weapon, the Twister Glaive, and it does wind damage. Now, it's reasonable to use for the same reason that Dart's Heat Blade is. However, I think for Lavitz, you generally just want to use the most powerful weapon possible to maximize his physical damage. And the reason for that is that if you're using him, you're probably going to want to use the turns in Dragoon form to cast Rose Storm and not use Dragoon additions. And if you want to know more about why Rose Storm is broken, go look at my Legend of Dragoon magic tier list. It'll really help you out. It's in the doodly too. There's a link there. Go click it. I don't really care about Shanna's weapon strength for the most part, to be completely honest. The special effects her weapons give her are what you should actually focus on. Now, I have a video all about Shanna that talks about why she doesn't care about physical attacks that I will link in the doodly do, so I won't discuss that too much here. The longbow, though, increases Shanna's accuracy. This can make it easier to farm the bird enemies, which will give you great experience and gold, particularly earlier in the game. We'll talk a little bit more about 
them later when I talk about character builds. The Sparkle Arrow does light damage, but honestly, it's too weak for me to care about that damage because Shanna won't gain much from it. Yeah, she'll get better Dragoon attacks in Dragoon form, but I would just use something else. The Bemusing Arrow causes Confused status, and that's similar to Dart's Mind Crush, and I already talked about why that was important in that section, but we will talk about that more a little bit later. The Arrow of Force gives 50% more SP and honestly is probably Shanna's best weapon. This allows her to level up her Dragoon form more quickly, and since she's a magic specialist, this is key to minimizing the number of physical attacks she needs to get back all of her spirit points. And finally, the Detonate Arrow is actually one of my favorite weapons in the game. It's the only weapon that can attack all enemies with a normal attack. It's still weak, but I appreciate that the devs tried something different. This weapon could have been extremely useful earlier in the game, but you get it so late that it's not really worthwhile to use. All that's left is the final boss. And by the way, the final boss of this video is the like button. Please blow that thing up to show your support for my terrible jokes. Rose actually has some pretty cool weapons. The Shadow Cutter does darkness damage, which of course increases the damage she can do with Dragoon additions in her special field. The Demon Cutter inflicts fear and the Flamberge inflicts sun. Those are cool. They're useful. And the Gladius can cause instant death, which I suppose is also useful. But if you just max out Rose's additions, she'll often do enough damage to kill everything very quickly regardless. Her final weapon, the Dragon Buster, is the clear best weapon in the game with 100 attack power. It also can inflict instant death. Now, unfortunately, Unfortunately, you get it right before the final battle, which makes me sad. But it's still an amazing weapon, and it makes Rose the strongest physical attacker at the end of the game. Hashel has four weapons that are worth talking about. The Beast Fang causes stun status, which can be quite useful to neuter enemies. And the Brass Knuckle causes instant death, which is very useful for random encounters. And the Thunder Fist is interesting. It inflicts thunder damage, but thunder has no opposite element. If you want to know more about elements in The Legend of Dragoon, I have a tips and tricks video that talks all about that. Again, it's linked in the discreetly do. But essentially, opposite element means more damage. So Hashel gets the advantage of Dragoon Edition boost from this, but won't be able to hit anyone for super effective damage, sadly. And finally, his Destroyer Mace that he gets at the end of the game is an amazing weapon. It greatly increases the amount of damage he does at low health, this means that its middling attack power of 55 is actually far higher. The multiplicative effect that he gets at low health also takes into account his personal strength, not just his weapon power. This weapon is incredible if you can keep Hashel at low health. Just give Kongol the weapon with the highest attack power. That's it. Smash! Mater's best weapon depends on how you want to play her. If you max out her additions, particularly her final perky step edition, just give her the strongest weapon and go to town. However, if you want to play her primarily as a dragoon, the pretty hammer is an amazing weapon. It doubles spirit points, and along with a maxed out cool boogie edition, she can get 400 spirit points in one turn. That can allow her to spam dragoon spells more fluidly. <laughs> In this game, headgear can be male, female, or non-binary. Fortunately though, most armor doesn't use pronouns, so please save your consideration of misgendering for real humans. And headgear's main purpose is increasing magic attack. If I don't mention a piece of headgear in this list, it just means that its only substantial value is its defense value, which is literally just a number and you should choose the higher number unless you're doing something crazy with one of the pieces of equipment I talk about here. But before I get into the individual pieces, let me talk about one specific armor group, and that's the armors that give you spirit points when you're attacked by enemies. These aren't bad, and again, I think the defense number is actually the most important thing. But particularly in battles where Dragoons are weakened, I don't like to use these. They can bring your Dragoons levels too high and ruin the Dragoon level 1 strategy, which I also talked about in my tips and tricks video. So there's really only one piece of mail armor that's worth mentioning, the Salat. It's an early piece of headgear that increases accuracy. You can hunt birds more easily with it, and that's about it. I would save one of these if you want to hunt birds later. Rose is the main beneficiary of special stuff from female headgear. Rose's hairband prevents instant death, which can be quite useful in certain battles, particularly since there are enemies later in the game who have instant kill spells for dragoons. Unfortunately, Rose is pretty frail though, so using this item means you have to sacrifice a more defensive option. Otherwise, I suppose the tiara could be useful for hunting certain birds. It adds 10% to magical attack accuracy, and there are certain birds that can only be attacked by magic. However, magic accuracy is rarely an issue in this game. This helmet is mainly useful for the small amount of defense it gives. 
This category has some of the best armor in the game. The Dragon Helm is unironically an amazing headgear choice for almost every character. It gives a huge magic attack boost, and more importantly, it increases HP by 50%. This removes any survivability issues that the character wearing this might have. The only issue is who to put it on, and I will talk about that a little bit later in this video. The Legend Cask is often talked about as the best helmet in the game, and it's easy to see why. It gives a legendary 127 point magic defense boost, along with a sizable magic attack boost, but more importantly, it also gives 50% magic evasion, and an ounce of prevention is truly worth a pound of cure. This is one of the weapons that turns fighting the final super boss into somewhat of a cakewalk. The only catch is that this piece of armor is available in Lohan and costs 10,000 gold. So how do you get that much gold? Well, the easiest way is probably killing the monster 00 parts, which drops 600 gold upon its death. They are hugely evasive and they can one-shot your characters and then just run away. But with a proper setup or just a ton of patience, they are quite killable. I plan to make another video on that soon, so stay tuned for that, and I will link that in the doodly-doo when it's finished. That being said, I think you might not want to use this armor, but I'll talk about that later in the video. The magical hat increases magic points by 50% and gives a huge boost to magic attack. This helmet is great if you want to use Meru, Shanna, or even Rose in a magical attacking role. It'll make it so that you can special and don't need to restore MP as often. It's available in a chest in Aglis and can be stolen from those guys on the ghost ship who look suspiciously like Lumpy Space Princess. All hail our lord and savior LSP. The final hat in the game is the Phoenix Plume. This hat prevents all of the mental status effects in the game, which can be quite useful. Now its stat boosts aren't quite as good as the other options, but it does get the job done. Armor is a little different than helmets because some characters have their own special armors, but we'll get there. The Armor of Yore prevents all physical status effects and has pretty good defensive stats. It can be equipped by Dart, Lavitz, or Hashel, and it's found in a chest right near where the Soul Eater is acquired. It's a great armor that I would strongly recommend using even though its defense is slightly lower than others. The Satori Vest found in a chest in Rouge does the exact same thing for Hashel. And speaking of Hashel, his Energy Girdle gives 50% more SP, which can be very useful for leveling up his dragoon form. And I appreciate that they shaded him a bit for his age by saying he needs a girdle. It's found with the Brother Merchants in Velweb, but you can get this early if it happens to drop from a Berserker enemy in the Giganto home. And we'll get to the dragoon armors in just a sec. The Angel Robe is kinda nifty. It has no defenses and can revive your character from death with some probability. I don't use it, but it does stack with the Holy Ankh's probability of reviving you from death. I will talk about that in the accessory section. And the final nifty difty female armor is the Rainbow Dress. This armor has a great defense stat which every female party member needs, and it protects against physical status effects, which can be super annoying. The only Gander neutral armor is the Armor of Legend, which is nothing short of amazing. With this one, physically squishy characters like Meru and Rose now take almost no damage from physical attacks, both because of the Gargantuan defense stat and also the 50 physical evade. Pair this with a Legend cask and you have an unbeatable force. Every character has a Dragoon armor available to them that will negate their Dragoon element. Now, this is definitely a useful trait, but every character already has some natural resistance to their own element anyway, making it a bit less useful. These armors have a big issue though. Their defense stats match those of their corresponding characters. So Shanna's Silver Dragoon armor has high magic defense and low physical defense, even though she's desperate for more physical defense. Kongol's armor, on the other hand, has high physical defense and terrible magic defense even though he's desperate for magic defense. By contrast, Hashel with good mixed defenses has incredibly balanced Dragoon armor, as does Dart. But in any case, what this means is that this armor helps specialists become more specialized. If you're going against an enemy with amazing physical damage and no magic damage, then Kongol becomes perfect. Great magic damage and no physical damage? Stick to Shanna or Meru. But most bosses in this game can do both, making many of these armors not so great. However, these armors are very useful in the Faust super boss fight because Faust always counters attacks with the element of the character who made the attack. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I make a separate video about Faust the super boss. The Dancer Shoes and the Bandit Shoes both do the same thing. They add 20 speed to your characters. 
when I play this game, I always have these equipped to somebody. Double the speed means double the turns, which means more opportunities to do damage and more opportunities to heal. The bandit shoes are found in the death frontier in a very specific chest, and the dancer shoes are found in a chest in the city of Cadessa. You can also steal them from the cute cat enemy, but that enemy is only found near the end of the game when you can't go back to the overworld, so... Meh. Another underrated item is the magical greaves, which I honestly almost always have equipped on Dart. They give 10 speed, making them a great choice for your third character who doesn't get your bandit or dancer shoes. They also give just a spot of physical and magical evasion, making your characters just a little bit more tanky. And really, every other set of boots is an inferior version of these. There's no reason to use anything else. There are a million and a half accessories in this game, so I am not going to talk about all of them, but here are the highlights. Now, these are mostly going to be in alphabetical order, and there will be timestamps, so you can just skip to the accessory that you need to look at. The amulet is obtainable from Martell for 20 Stardust. It gives you a boatload more MP and is great for magic users who want to special and smash without restoring MP. The Angel Scarf, Dragon Shield, and Phantom Shield are all quite useful. While you probably don't have enough money to get the Phantom Shield the first time you're in Lohan without a huge grind, the Dragon or Angel Scarf can be great choices. The characters who really need these items are ones who are weak on one side or the other. So you can give Shanna or Meru the Dragon Shield or Kongol and Lavitz an Angel Scarf. They take a ton of money to get and to find out more about that grind, just head back to the helmet section where I talked about the legend cask. The bandit's ring and dancer's ring are the obvious winners here. They each raise your character's speed by 20, and they are easy picks to give your characters more turns and therefore let them do more damage or heal. The bandit's ring is available in the house of Gigantos in a chest, and the dancer's ring is in a really annoying chest in the snowfield. I'll likely make a very short, dedicated video showing how to get this item, so look out for that one. Status prevention accessories can be very useful, but generally these fall off as the game progresses and you get better accessories. Also, dragoons can't be inflicted with status, and turning into a dragoon removes any negative status effects that are applied to your character. But there is one boss battle, the battle against the Guardians of Xenobatos, where the D-Stone amulet is incredibly useful. One of them uses a petrifying attack, and unless you special to get rid of it or have a D-Stone item, which you should have if you're not going to wear this, you can get completely stuck without a character. I still think it's better to just have the healing item, but this is an alternative that can keep you safe. The Holy Ankh revives a character from death, but it's chance-based, so it's not 100%. But combining it with the Angel Robe gives a pretty good chance of revival. Now, this is a missable item, so make sure you grab it from the Crystal Palace of Deningrad before something happens to it. The Physical Ring is a great way to increase character's bulk. It increases HP by 50%. Now, it can be used on anyone, but the higher the HP of the character and the more balanced their stats, the more useful this item will be. So while Kongol, Albert, Shanna, and Meru can certainly use it, it sees better use on Dart and Hashel, since all of their stats are right in the middle. Dart almost always wants to use the Therapy Ring. You can get this in Hell in a Prison the second time you go there. This ring heals HP by 10% every single turn, which coincidentally is the exact amount that his best weapon, the Soul Eater, takes away every single turn. The ultimate war god is very interesting. It makes additions automatically complete with no addition timing needed. This can help a ton with the grind, but it definitely falls off once all additions are mastered. It costs 10,000 gold in Lohan, and one of these is also present on the ghost ship, but the minigame to get it is extremely RNG based. I'll try to find a guide for you guys on YouTube that I can put in the description, but I'm honestly probably not going to make a guide on that for a long time. It's very tedious, and I haven't even gotten this item because I'm just not doing it. Listen, I'm starting a solo dart challenge for you guys, so do not hassle me on this one, okay? Maybe I'll post a small guide. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if that's what you want. I actually love comments. Your guys' comments are awesome, and you always correct the dumb things that I say. The War God Amulet adds 20% chance to hit rate. With this item, farming birds for EXP and gold becomes a lot easier, but no need to use these in any battle but those. If I missed any accessories that you guys think are important, please let me know in the comments, or come yell at me in the Tantacles Discord, which I'll put a link to in the doodly do. Okay, I know, I know, it's taken a lot of time to get to the builds. If you skip to this timestamp, you can always go back to earlier parts if you want to hear about the items themselves or how to get them. Before we even start though, let me just say that I don't want to say it over and over so any character can use the bandits or dancers equipment. Increasing speed really improves your character, so when in doubt, just use the speed boosting equipment. Just use it. 
please. So in this first section, I'm gonna assume that you're not grinding for legendary equipment, but do not worry, we'll talk about legend casks a little bit later. Also, while I'm focusing on the best build for each character, to some extent, I'll also be taking into account who else might want equipment who's in the party. I'm assuming a team with Dart, one male character, and one female character though, just for the sake of not having to come up with 17 different builds for each character. For Dart, I think equipping the Soul Eater with a therapy ring is the most efficient strategy. In addition, I almost always give Dart the magical greaves for the little speed boost, saving the bandit shoes for someone else. Now, before you get the Soul Eater, either use the highest attack weapon you have or the Heat Blade, depending on how you plan to play. If you're gonna special and use Dragoon attacks, Heat Blade is probably the way to go, but otherwise, use the high attack weapons. I would also recommend using Dart's Dragoon armor. There is some nasty fire attacks, particularly later in the game, and he'll definitely want to absorb them. As far as hats are concerned, I give him the Phoenix Plume to prevent status. He's always in the party, and it gives a spot of magic defense as well, so he's a good choice for it. The better helms are more strongly desired, though, by other characters, so I usually just stick with this for Dart. He's going to be at a higher level anyway, so he's going to be more bulky than everyone else in aggregate. Now, Lavitz desperately wants more speed, so there's that. He's also a good choice for the Dragon Helm, as he has terrible magic defense and needs the extra HP to compensate for that. But I think there are other characters that can probably use it better than Lavitz can use it. And that's because Rose Storm patches up his defenses really well. Again, link in the doodly-doo to a video all about Lavitz. Use the highest attack spear and the speedy stuff and you've got yourself a tornado going. His Dragoon armor works well for him, but I actually prefer to give him the Saint armor for just a spot more magic defense. He'll probably still find magic awful to deal with, but hey, listen, we did our best, okay? I can't fix everything. For Shanna, just give her a weapon that has a special effect. She does not care about attack. She also wants to be speedy and have as much attack as possible, so give her the magical hat for headgear. This has the added bonus of increasing her magic points. For armor, I recommend the rainbow dress for preventing status and giving her a great defense stat. One alternative accessory for her, though, is the amulet. This will further allow Shanna to spam magic, although she'll be a little bit slower. But I do think that this build is suboptimal because Shanna probably wants to use magic items in human form, so this item forces you to have fewer turns in exchange for more damage in Dragoon form. And one more build you must know about is the farming build, which really we should call the hunting build, but it's farming, it's an RPG. This build prioritizes maximum accuracy with the longbow and the war god amulet. It allows Shanna to have an amazing chance to hit the birds and get you a ton of of gold and EXP for the party. For weapon, just give Rose the weapon with the highest attack stat. The special effects are nice, but generally you don't need them for basic battles because basic battles are easy enough for Rose to kill things with just her basic attacks. Now, if things get dicey, you just defend. Rose desperately wants the Dragon Helm because she's frail both magically and physically. And of course she wants speed, so give her the things. Rose's hairband is an alternative if you want to be a dragoon in fights where dragoons get one-shotted, but I don't think it's the best option. Rose's dragoon armor is also pretty good, but she does best with the rainbow dress because, again, her physical defense is god-awful. This is Tantacles in editing mode. Her dark dragoon armor is actually better than the rainbow dress. It has better physical defense, so just use that. Ignore what I said about the rainbow dress, please. And I guess if you want to spam magic, you could go the Shanna route and just give her all the MP boosting items, but Rose's physical strength is far far more robust in my opinion, so I don't love that build for her specifically. I will be providing one build for Hashel and one build alone. Give him the most powerful weapon you have, give him some kind of helmet, I like the Phoenix Plume with the Soul Headband, and purple Dragoon Armor, given the mixed defenses, and then give him speed items for his shoes and a speed accessory. And you're good to go. Just grind up your additions to max and he will hit really hard. Kongol wants to smash, so give him his most powerful weapon. And it might seem counterintuitive, but Kongol would love the Dragon Helm to help out with his magic defense. If that's already taken by another character, just give him whatever has the highest magic defense. Seriously, because he's so low, every single point of magic defense matters. And then give him the Giganto Armor. It has a tiny bit more magic defense than the Golden Dragoon Armor, which I guess is another option, but is not as good. Editing Tantacles here, I don't know why I said to give him the Giganto Armor, that was stupid. Just give him the Armor of Yore, it has 10 more points of magic defense. That makes a lot more sense. Then give him the Speedy Shoes and the Speedy Ring, and he's good 
good to go. One alternative is to give him the Dragon Helm and the Physical Ring to increase his bulk to 11. And this will actually repair his magic defense issue. Except then he won't have speed, and he'll literally get fewer than half the turns of many of the other characters. And since a dead enemy can't kill you, it might be better to just give him more speed and hit for more damage. Meru actually has a couple of interesting builds. The first is the pure magic build. Give her the pretty hammer, the magic hat, and the amulet. This way she'll have a ton of MP and she can spam her most powerful spells over and over without restoring MP. Give her a rainbow dress for physical defense and the dancer shoes for speed and she can wreck. She'll get a ton of extra spirit points so she can be in dragoon form an awful lot. Next up, this build, but with a stronger weapon, can function pretty well as a mixed attacker. I don't love this build, I kind of like for Meru to focus in on one thing, but it does work. And I think the next build is her best, because she really wants the Dragon Helm to improve her HP. Her physical defense really needs work. And given that her final addition is quite powerful, this build will let you spam it because we're giving up all of her extra MP and giving her maximum speed with a dancer ring. And finally, I did promise a section on the legendary armors, the legend cask and the armor of legend. If you put these together, your characters basically become invincible. Their defenses are sky high. But here's the problem. If you make a character invincible, the game is essentially not a challenge. So while I think it can be fun to just sort of run through the game with the best defenses possible, I don't like playing that way. It basically ruins any challenge of the game and you can literally just tap enemies without even doing additions and kill them. Now granted, I don't think that this game is that hard to begin with, but I just think it's not good to ruin it by giving yourself the best armor ever. So the way I like to play is to use either the Angel Scarf or the Dragon Shield to reduce magical or physical damage by half on characters that truly need it. Giving Meadow a Dragon Shield, particularly earlier in the game, is a great way to play that just makes it so she won't die as easily to physical attacks. And finally, I plan to make an entire video about Faust eventually once I collect all the Stardust in my file, because I haven't done it yet. But there are two ways that you can go about fighting Faust. Pair this with evasion items and your characters can dodge up to 70 or even 75% of all magic attacks if you're using the magical greaves. But if you don't want to play with the legend cask, using characters dragoon armors is a great way to go. As I mentioned before in this video, Faust always counterattacks with the element of the enemy who attacked him. So if Kongol attacks him, he'll use an earth counter. If Dart attacks him, he'll use a fire counter. Anyway, enough said about that. I'll leave that for another video. Thanks for watching. Join the Discord, like the video, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.